Good morning, and I'd like to invite you, if you have your copy of God's Word, to turn to the Gospel of Luke as we look together at uh, Luke chapter 20 and uh, verses 27 through 40. I will uh, read, and, and you could follow along. The words are also projected on the screen, so you could follow along that way as well. The Word of God says, Uh, There came to him some Sadducees, uh, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring, offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. Uh, The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die any more because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they no longer dared to ask him any question. Now may the Lord bless the reading of of his word to our hearts and our minds and our hands because we seek to not only be hearers, but doers of the word of God. So the chapter of of this gospel, the chapter 20, opens specifically uh, with the opponents of Jesus, more specifically the Sadducees and the, the scribes trying to trap Jesus. In most of the Gospel of Luke, we see the Pharisees as the most antagonistic to Jesus' ministry. And the Pharisees, we've said, were folks that had persuasion amongst the people. They were over the uh, synagogues. And um, the Sadducees were over the temple, was over the temple, and they were people of of means. They had wealth. And they weren't really... Uh, together, they didn't see things theologically the same. They didn't see things politically the same necessarily. But when it came to Jesus, they did see things the same way. Both the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted Jesus gone. So chapter 20 opens up with these Sadducees being antagonistic to the ministry of Jesus and bringing people to him to try to trap or question or uh, make him falter or fumble so that they could either show to the crowds that he is wrong, that he's a false teacher, or eventually, as what happened, lead to his uh, crucifixion and get him taken out permanently. Even in the middle of the chapter, we see how they were sending in spies to kind of look sympathetic to Jesus and appearing to ask sincere questions, but they were really just trying to, again, trap him. Now, you could say, well, that's not right, or they're the Sadducees, they're evil, they shouldn't have been doing that to Jesus. Uh, Jesus eventually had the upper hand in the answer, and we're glad of that. But when I was looking at the passage and thinking about how it applied to us today, one of the things I realized is, in one sense, we're not very different, particularly when it comes to eschatology. Eschatology is the theological study of last things, uh, end times. Personal eschatology means what's going to happen to us in the end or towards the end or or what's going to happen to us after we die. And Christians have been debating and arguing about this for a long time. Whole denominations and churches 
exist because they didn't agree with what another denomination or another church said about what's going to happen in the end times. And so we fight about eschatology as Christians all the time. The rapture is going to happen. The rapture is not going to happen. There's going to be a tribulation. There's not going to be a tribulation. The tribulation is going to begin three years uh, after uh, the rapture, the, you know, uh, mid-rapture, post-rapture, mid-trip. You can come up with all these. And you know what? People start getting into uh, theological fistfights, Jerry Springer style, and they, they throw chairs and they argue and, and they fuss and they split churches. And that's kind of what the Sadducees are doing here. They're having a theological, eschatological debate with Jesus. Because as we read in the text, the Sadducees didn't believe that there was a life after death. Uh, they didn't believe in angels. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible and the Old Testament. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was the Torah. That's what they held to. They didn't hold to the writings or the prophets. And so if there was going to be a theology, if there was going to be a teaching, it had to come from Moses, and they didn't believe that Moses taught about the resurrection. So they were trying to trap Jesus in this way. Jesus, his response to them is that they're looking at it wrong. This age is not like that age. This life is not like the resurrection life. This is not that, is what Jesus' is, his argument is. And now we're going to go over that. I'm going to try to explain a little bit, and it's kind of different, and it might be even kind of weird to our understanding. And so I'm just going to ask you to, to hold with me a minute, okay, so we can get through this stuff. I want you to understand Jesus' argument with the Sadducees so that eventually we can come to the point where understanding what Jesus is talking about when he's referencing the resurrection, because I believe this is important for us today. But some of the arguments, some of the things are a little difficult or, or kind of irrelevant to the way we live and the way we think today. But if we understand those things, it'll help us understand what Jesus is saying for us here today and now. You see, what the Sadducees are doing is they're bringing up from the law, from the book of Moses, specifically uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 and forward, they're talking about this uh, leveret marriage concept. Okay, Moses taught that if there was a man who was married and died without having a son, and if this man lived near brothers, then his brother, next in line, should marry the woman, have a child, and that first child they have was to be carrying the name of the brother that passed away. And not only the name, but any property, because land is very important for the Israelites. Their land is their legacy. That's how the Pharisees, the Sadducees, excuse me, believed that someone lives on. Not so much uh, in heaven or in a resurrection or in an afterlife, but you live on, you pass on your name and your legacy as you have children. And as you have children and they have children, your legacy, your heritage goes on and on and on and on. And so, they were saying, if this uh, liberate marriage law is applicable, and it's law because Moses said it is, so this woman, they make up this, this crazy illustration, right? This extreme illustration. There's a woman who has not one, not two, not three, seven husbands, and they all die, and none of her leave her with any children. Then, in the resurrection, whose wife is she going to be? Moses says, you know, the law says we're to have a wife or to be monogamous. If we're monogamous in the resurrection, hey, what's the situation, Jesus? And of course, they weren't really looking for an answer. They were looking to show how ridiculous it is that there was something called a resurrection. Because they thought about, they pondered the law, they took the law seriously. They thought the law was applicable to every area of life, which it is. So they were thorough in their understanding and their thought of the law. And they said, listen, it doesn't make any sense. If there's a resurrection, then whose wife is this woman going to be? Therefore, there can be no resurrection. Well, to understand a little bit, we have to understand from an Old Testament perspective 
what the meaning and the purpose of marriage is, right? First of all, uh, marriage is meant for us to display the image of God. We're going to do a little bit of history, right? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he would create something and then he would declare that it is what? Good. And he did that all. The, he created the light. And he said it is good. The stars, it is good. The plants, it is good. Only one time in creation did God say, this is not good. And what was that? What did God say was not good in creation? You say man is not good in creation? That's No, you're right. He said it is not good for man to be alone. Yeah. This is good. This is good. Uh-oh. This isn't good. And the Bible says he created them, male and female, in his image. He created them. Marriage is, the primary purpose of marriage, particularly when we look at it in the Old Testament context, is to perfectly, or more perfectly, more completely, I should say, display the image of God. God, we understand, is spirit. God, we understand, does not have a gender. Now, of course, the Old Testament, the Bible, uh, does give more often uh, male Pronouns to God, God the Father and He and that sort of thing. But the Bible also gives female qualities to God. Isaiah 66, 13, God comforts His people like a mother comforts her child. Isaiah 49, 15, like a woman would never forget her nursing child, God will never forget His children. Deuteronomy 32, God is like a mother eagle hovering over her young. Luke 15, God seeks the lost like a housekeeper trying to find her lost coin. Psalm 22, God cares for his people like a midwife that cares for the child she just delivered. God experiences the fury of a mother bear robbed of her cubs, Hosea 13.8. Jesus longed for the people of Jerusalem like a mother hen longs to, be, to gather her chicks under her wings, Luke 13.34. And so if marriage proclaims or displays the image of God, the image of God is best reflected, male and female, the two shall become one flesh. Even the Trinity is portrayed in marriage. So marriage displays the image of God. As God is three in one, marriage is two in one. But like I already mentioned, marriage is also for procreation, particularly here in the Old Testament. When the Sadducees believe that you are, your legacy, your heritage continues in your, in your children. The land is passed from son to son. And so, uh, land is important. Your legacy is important. And so marriage is for procreation. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Now Jesus is saying here, right, that they're looking at they're looking at marriage and the way things are here and saying, well, they must be the same there. If this is how things are here, if there's a resurrection, it's just going to be a continuation of here. So here and there are the same. This and that are the same. Right? But Jesus, in a sense, he's holding up a coin. All right, here's a quarter. And what the Sadducees are doing is they're looking at the head side and they're unable to think about or comprehend the resurrection because all they're thinking about is heads. And Jesus said, no, this is not that. This life is not how that life is. This age and that age are different. In this life, we need to marry we need to have kids, we need to go to work, we need to pay taxes, etc., etc., etc. But in that age, he says, they're not married, they're not given in marriage. Why? Because they never die. That's what he says. Participating in the resurrection means no longer dying and being fully united to God. Therefore, there's no need for marriage. This life and that life are not the same. Right? Do we understand that part of Jesus' argument? Makes sense, right? 
They're trying to say that, that it doesn't make sense for a monogamous uh, relationship to continue in heaven when it hasn't been monogamous on earth. Jesus is saying, this is not that, first of all. Now, I don't think that's going to convince them. So he uh, continues, and he gives a, a further explanation to them. And in, in a way, he's showing us this and that. Now, what do I mean? Follow with me. Don't get lost. Jesus turns to a, a passage in Scripture to teach them about the resurrection. Which passage in Scripture does Jesus uh, point them to? Well, who does Jesus point them to? Who's that? Moses. Why does he point them to Moses? There's verses in the Psalms. There's verses in Job. There's verses in Daniel that point to a resurrection. But remember, the, the Sadducees didn't hold those books to be true. They only held the books of Moses to be true. So here comes Jesus using Exodus, the story of Moses in the burning bush, to show them that there is indeed a resurrection. Right? Exodus chapter 2. I mean, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that, that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So here's something very important. He says, you're looking at it this way when you need to be looking at it that way. This and that are not the same. But now he's saying, look, your scriptures, Moses says himself that God says, I am the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Jacob. And so Jesus poses the question, now is God the God of the living or of the dead? And of course, the only answer they could give is, God is the God of the living. Now, this challenges my view of the resurrection, my understanding of what resurrection means. Resurrection, in my mind, was always, it happens in a point in time when certain events take place in God's sovereignty. And he calls the dead out of the tomb. And then he recreates them, resurrects them, resuscitates them, transforms them, and so that we now live with God forever and ever, amen, in eternity. But now that event called the resurrection hasn't transpired yet. But God here is telling the Sadducees, God is not the God of the dead. God is the God of the living. Therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are now, now enjoying and living united with God and the benefit of full, not, full life in the resurrection. And that really isn't, isn't surprising, or it's not um, confounding, because we understand, right, that all life, all life is lived by and through and in the power of God. That's what Paul says in Acts 17, 28. He says, in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed, we are indeed his offspring. So all life takes place in the power of God, whether in this current life or in the life to come. In addition, once one knows God, one has everlasting life. This is what everlasting life is, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. 
So there's a sense in which, listen, there's a sense in which the resurrection is one side of the coin, and this life or this age is the other side of the coin, two different things that look completely different, and they're not the same. But there's another sense, and this is what I hope we understand today, there's another sense, God is the God of the living, those that know God are living in God now. What does uh, the Apostle Paul say in first uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1? He says, If then you have been raised with Christ. Does he say there, If then you will be raised with Christ? Colossians 3, 1? If then you will be raised with Christ? No, he says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What did Jesus tell Martha when her brother John was, I'm sorry, when her brother Lazarus was dead in the tomb? And Jesus tells Martha, you're going to see your brother again. And what does she say? I know, I know, Lord. In the resurrection, I'm going to see him again. One day, in the resurrection, I'm going to see him again. And what does Jesus say? Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And here's the question for Martha, and it's the question for you. Do you believe this? I am the resurrection. Now, today, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So here's the thing. It's natural, I I believe, I think, it's natural. Natural for us, uh, I think, like the Sadducees, to see this and that as kind of the same. And when we lose somebody, it's natural to want that relationship to continue, even though we know that it can't continue because the person has has died, right? But there's a, a natural longing, I think, to to be with that person and to relate to that person again. That's a part of the grief process. In the in the Jewish uh, religion, um, about a year after a loved one dies, they have a ceremony that's called the unveiling, where uh, they go back to the cemetery where the person is buried, the loved one is buried, and they have a cloth over the headstone, and because um, usually the headstone isn't there at the, at the burial. They have to work on it and whatever. So the unveiling ceremony, they unveil the headstone. They show what's on the headstone. And then they have a little ceremony where they remember the person. They talk about the person. They laugh. They cry. They read uh, scripture. They pray. They uh, revisit the loss. And that's important. I don't know that As Baptists or evangelicals, we do that very well. Sometimes the wound doesn't heal well, so doctors have to reopen the wound, right? So that it could heal. And I think that's a part of what this unveiling is. They revisit the the wound to make sure that that healing is happening. This past week, uh, you know, you may have noticed it was uh, October 31st is, is Halloween. In the Catholic Church, that's All Hallows' Eve. It's a day before All Hallows' Day or All Saints' Day. It's a day of remembering or commemorating uh, the saints, the heroes of the faith, that sort of thing. In some Spanish cultures, primarily the Mexican culture, there's a day, uh, if you saw the movie Coco, it's called the Dia de los Muertos, right? The Day of the Dead. And that's celebrated in Mexican culture. It's a day... um, that in a, I'm not an expert on it, but it's a, it's a, in a sense of the day where they believe that the dead are, are close to them again. 
So they, they make altars and they put on the altars flowers, marigold flowers, and pictures of the, of the deceased, and also some of their favorite things as ofrendas, because they feel that that day or those couple days, whatever it is, they get to be with and remember and commemorate their loved ones again, that they're dancing with them or celebrating with them or being with them. I heard a heartbreaking story uh, this week. It brought me to tears. Uh, the Uvalde community in Texas celebrated Dia de los Muertos for the first time since the, the mass shooting in that elementary school where 19 babies were shot and two teachers. And I think what made, I didn't ignore, I think what made me pay attention to this story this time around was they mentioned this woman named April Elrod. She lost her 10-year-old daughter, McKenna, in the shooting. And so she had an altar uh, with the community. They celebrated together. And on her altar, she had Takis, which were McKenna's favorite chips, and Dum Dum lollipops, which were her favorite lollipops. Now, here's what caught my attention. The story was heartbreaking. But she said, it's the first time we've set one up, talking about the altar. She said, we're Baptists. It's not a holiday that we normally celebrate. But we felt this year that we wanted to celebrate with these other families. Again, the need to revisit, the need to confront, the need to face the loss. And there's this human desire that these relationships continue. And the only way, if we're looking at the coin from one side, the only way we could think about these relationships continuing is if this is that, if this is the same thing. So we offer Takis. Or we offer lollipops, which is a heartbreak. I mean, it, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that's what we do. We want to spend time with our deceased family as if they were not deceased, as if they were still here. But the gospel, the good news is that there is a resurrection, that Jesus is the resurrection, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That right now, the dead in Christ are experiencing the abundant life in Christ. The fullness of life in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit. Unhindered joy, grace, love, forgiveness, beauty, glory. Our loved ones that are dead in Christ are experiencing that right now. But the even better news is that that's the life that you and I are invited to participate in now today. Jesus is the resurrection. If you have been raised with Christ, set your mind on things that are above. So the way to best honor our loved ones, the way to best commune with the saints, is not to call them and ask them to muddle through our problems and our lives back here uh, in this age. But for us, in the power of the Spirit of God, to join them in the fullness of life that they are experiencing, that is offered to us in Christ today. I came, says Jesus, so that you might have life, and so that you might have life abundantly. Don't wait! You could enjoy the same fullness. You could enjoy the same love. You could enjoy the same fruit of the Spirit today as your loved ones are experiencing fully in glory. It's the same. There's a song that, that says that. One day Jesus will call my name. As days go on, I hope they don't stay the same. I want to get so close to Him that there's no big change on that day that Jesus calls my name. You get it? We could have heavenly life, abundant life, now. When we forgive, when we love, when we have patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, we are practicing the way of life that it is in glory. So not people coming back and living in our anxieties, our worries, our strife, our fear but us joining them in the abundant life of heaven. There was a, a mom, and she heard her son upset, crying. So she goes to check on him, because it was the day after Christmas. He should be playing with his toy, 
that he got. He got this balsam wood airplane. And he loved it, and he was playing with it all day and laughing and throwing it and having a grand old time. But when mom came down to see him, she noticed that he threw it, and it broke. And it broke beyond repair. So he was inconsolable. She tried, but he was upset. He was grieving over his airplane. Went on for a few days, crying, upset, wishing that he still had the airplane, wishing that he wouldn't have thrown it, regretting that he did that, feeling guilty, all these things about his airplane. Well, then a couple days later, Mom heard laughing again. And the, the steps of, of a little boy playing and rejoicing. So she went to check on him. What's going on? I, you were so sad yesterday. What's, he had taken the airplane and he had made it into a perfectly good slingshot. He transformed it. No longer it's a broken airplane. Now it's a perfectly good slingshot. And he was playing with it. And he was having a great time because he had transformed the brokenness. He can tr transform what was dead. He transformed what was irreplaceable, irreparable into something new and different and wonderful and joyful. And that's what we're called to do with our grief. That's what we're called to do with our dead. This is not that. But we have the blessing and the benefit as believers in Christ for this and that. We transform, we resurrect, we're renewed, we have abundant life. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. I don't know that you're grieving. I don't know that you're experiencing loss. Let me invite you to not deny it, not suppress it, not to push it under the rug. But also, as grace allows, as time allows, as the gospel allows, let that loss be transformed in your heart to something new. No longer guilty about what was or hanging on to what could have been or what should have been. No longer offering tackies and dum-dums as precious as that is. But living the life of faith and obedience and forgiveness that your loved ones in Christ are living now. Join them in living that abundant life now. You can live it today. And you'll be closer to them than ever before. Because it's true life. It's real life. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this time in your word.